tonight, technical foul. A girls high school basketball coach says enough is enough and pulls his team off the court after a trans player injures three of his girls. Will common sense ever stop the madness? Do the math. The U.S. spends hundreds of millions of dollars trying to stop Houthi missile attacks, but it's not working. How China keeps winning in the Battle of the Red Sea. And what's a bribe? John Oliver offers Clarence Thomas a million dollars to walk away from the Supreme Court. Just sign this contract. Resign, and the money is all yours. This is not a joke. It's funny. Is it legal? Welcome to the Ferris Show on television. First tonight, sometimes a debate that we've been having for a long time comes down to one piece of video. One piece of video crystallizes what we've all been thinking and feeling. That happened when this morning our team watched a clip of a girls' high school basketball game in Massachusetts. As you can see, there was a girl there on the ground withering in pain. This wasn't a state championship. It was a girls' basketball game. The person who knocked her down, as you can also see, does not seem to care. Turns out that person is reportedly a boy who's over six feet tall and is said to identify as a girl playing in a girls' basketball game. And because of the rules in Massachusetts sports, this person gets to play on the girls' team. In this case, he injured three girls on the opposing team by halftime. The coach at the Collegiate Charter School of Lowell did what few coaches are brave enough to do. He literally blew the whistle and pulled his team from the court before they, all the girls who were playing by the rules, got injured. In some bizarre land we live in, he was forced to forfeit the game. Better perhaps to live and play another day, literally. Casey Crane from Collegiate Charter School of Lowell wrote a memo saying the school supports the decision to forfeit the game, but the memo doesn't even use the word transgender. It doesn't mention why so many of the girls were injured, and it promises to ensure equity for all students. Equity is an important part of this story. The coach should get a write-up about having a profile in courage. Those are rare these days in education and worthy of being noted when they happen. As for the principal, well, her actions are par for the course. But that word in the principal statement, equity, really stuck with us. It's a buzzword, right? And according to the dictionary, we'll put the definition back up on the screen, quality of being fair and impartial. And really, who can be against things that are fair? America's built on fairness. We talk about fairness every night here. Except this video showing boys playing on girls' teams is anything but fair. It's dangerous. This isn't about the suspected transgender kid. It really isn't. We should all have compassion for anybody who's going through such a difficult and confusing time as a teenager. So just put him or her or however they would like to be identified aside for a second. This is about all the other girls on the court. They also deserve fairness. There's nothing fair about playing against people born of the opposite sex who are twice one size. There's nothing fair about getting beat up on a basketball court where the referees live in fear of trans activists. There's nothing fair about a school where the coaches do the right thing only for the administrators to both sides their statement. Sylvia Hatchell is with us, former head basketball coach for the University of North Carolina Lady Tar Heels, the fifth most career wins in women's college basketball history. In an odd way, are you happy of all the issues that you had to deal with that this wasn't one of them? Yes, I am. And I would like to uh, pat the coach on the back yeah. for uh, taking his team uh, off uh, and, and taking a stand because you know, playing against transgenders, it's not fair and it's not equal. It's not a level playing field. So uh, the females should not have to play against transgenders. Uh, we're going to get to sort of the, the issues of where this is going in society in a minute. But 
One thing that's sort of bothered me from the beginning about this, especially when it's a, a physical sport, uh, that there's so clearly a difference, right? Average male player, six feet, wingspan, five, six, vertical jump, 28 inches. Average women's players, five, six. I think this is in high school, um, five, two, and a 20 inch wingspan. There's no comparison here. And obviously, we can see the video. This individual we're talking about is over six feet tall, um, clearly physically very different. Do you have any idea why? young men want to compete against young girls? I don't get it. Well, maybe they can't be successful playing against guys. And so, you know, they play against women, just like the swimmer did uh, against Brittany Gaines. You know, uh, so I, I don't know. But it's, it's just not yeah. fair and equal. You know, in 72, I was a sophomore in college when Title IX was passed. Title IX was passed to make things fair and equal for females and having to play against transgenders is not fair and it's not equal. If you just made this point, if you're six five, you're six five. I don't care if you've had an operation or you're taking hormones or what, you're still six five. And the wingspan, I mean it's just it's just not fair and sure. it's not equal. It, it's really it, it's disappointing that we're actually having to go through this and debate this. So uh but yeah. but I it, it, it does I, sometimes feel like you're arguing against the win when you're sort of saying what you're saying, which is this not fair. And look, in the case of Leah Thomas, the swimmer who you're talking about, right. there's no there's no chance of people getting hurt, right? It's not fair, perhaps, that uh, someone can, you know, some young man or some man beats beats a woman's swimmer um, and takes away what is rightfully their honor of being the fastest swimmer or something. But in this case, you actually are dealing with kids getting injured. Um, You've seen a lot of changes in sports, and obviously when Title IX was passed, it was extraordinarily controversial. Where do you see this going now? What has to happen, you think, for this to to actually change? Well, a lot of states have already made rulings, but it's probably going yeah. to end up in the support. You know, uh, I mean, I, I would see that it going there, but you know, you're just talking about why would a, a transgender want to play, a male transgender want to play against females, well, maybe he's not that successful playing against men, and, you know, he can feed his ego and be successful yeah. uh, playing against females. So, but again, you know, it, it's, you, you, your in, the injuries are there, and then also the opportunities for other women to be on that court right. and be playing, you know, when, when the transgender is out there. But it, it's just, uh, I mean, it, it's just crazy because it's, it, it's not a level playing field on lots of, of, of levels. Yeah. It's interesting, actually, the polling on this has started to move, even among Democrats, uh, because it is a political issue now. Um, but there, there is a growing group, uh, significantly growing group of people who are, who are agreeing with you. Coach, it was great having you. Thank you. Um, we're, we're better for having heard your perspective on this. We appreciate it. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Thank you, ma'am. President Biden is quite literally, literally, walking away now from questions about Israel. <laughs> On answers, well, answers like that shouldn't surprise us. President Biden has put himself now in an impossible position. Today, the United States, under his direction, vetoed a United Nations Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire between Hamas and Israel, meaning a unilateral Israeli ceasefire, right? That means it's a huge victory for Hamas. But at the same time, President Biden's team wants a temporary ceasefire. It makes no sense. The lack of moral clarity is stunning. It makes no strategic sense in terms of how Israel is prosecuting this war. But then you've got to think about domestic politics for President Biden. Here's Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, Democrat of Michigan, telling fellow Democrats not to vote for Biden in their own primary. Right now, we feel completely neglected, neglected and just unseen by our government. If you want us to be louder, then come here and vote uncommitted. All right. The mayor of Dearborn, Michigan, a highly progressive community, says he won't be supporting President Biden 
in the primary. Jonathan Cott is here, former senior advisor to Joe Manchin, best dressed man in Washington. <laughs> Welcome to the program. Thank you. How did Democrats end up with a pro Hamas wing? I think it's a very small wing. I think Rashida Tlaib represents a very small segment of the Democratic Party. I think the president is the leader of the party, and he is shown to be probably the strongest president for Israel that we've ever had. I think Rashida Tlaib is part of the party that doesn't care about winning and doesn't care about getting anything done. She's been in Congress a few years, and I couldn't tell you one of her accomplishments other than probably getting a lot of Twitter followers and getting and some well, and, and raising a lot of money for APAC, too, sure. because, yeah. because of how, how she's, she's handled this. Uh, we can quibble over the most pro-Israel president or not, uh, but I think what's interesting, Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas war among voters under the age of 35, just 15 percent approve of his handling, 70 percent uh, disapprove. Uh, they don't disapprove because they think that he should be uh, more pro-Israel. They disapprove right. because they think he should be more pro-Hamas. Uh, again, how did Democrats end up with this problem? I, I think for the young people, it's where they're getting their news and their lack of information. I think a lot of it is they're getting news on TikTok. They're not actually understanding what is going on. And to your point, it's not a whether they're pro or anti-Israel. These are people who are now saying they're pro Hamas, a terrorist organization right. that murdered, raped and killed babies, women and children on October so, 7th. So I think these people need to get a little bit more educated and understand what's actually going on in the world. Why let facts get in the way of, of good, of good <laughs> exactly. emotion? We, we, we wrote about this on, on WarNotes.com, which is our, yep. our daily newsletter. Which I read. Um, well, we, appre <laughs> we appreciate that. But there is a lack of moral clarity coming from President Biden. There's a lack of violence of action, which is, which is how you prosecute a war. It's the only way to win. What I find fascinating is, is that for a president who seems to want to exert some kind of control over the Israelis, he wants them to hold off from, from going into Rafa as if that's somehow going to help the Palestinian population, the Muslim population in America be more pro-Joe Biden. He wants all these things. But does he understand that the more moral equivalence he puts in, the more Israel ignores what he's saying? I think he's, it's a very fine balance to walk, right? He has to let Israel go and prosecute the war the way they want it, but he also has to unite the world like he did behind the Ukraine effort. And I think right now what you're seeing is there's a lot of countries out there who, are, who have no interest in supporting Israel and their efforts and will just always be pro-Hamas. And that's the fine line because you're, you're getting a... You know, we well, want to hold on. But th this is where this is where I don't understand, and I and I think that this is a huge missed opportunity as somebody who lived in the Middle East. And yeah. you, you think about the power of persuasion, the power of the president to come out and say, "Yeah, I think Israel should be doing a better job," but I also think that Egypt needs to be doing a better job. I think Jordan needs to be doing a better Absolutely. job. I think the Emiratis and the Qataris, in name and shame, I think the Turks need to be doing a better job. And this seems to be sort of a hallmark of President Biden's foreign policy is to sort of be half in and half out, half in, half out on Ukraine, half in, half out on taking on the Houthis, half in, half out on, on taking on China. Well, I think he's been all in on Ukraine. He's just hasn't really? had, yeah, he hasn't had the congressional support uh, okay. that he wants. We're not putting troops on the ground in Ukraine. We're giving them everything they need to actually beat the Russians. And when we were doing that, when we had congressional support, we, the, the Ukrainians were winning. I do think what he's trying to do right now is work more behind the scenes through the UN. You saw the, you saw the US today reject the the treaty by the UN and put in their own. So I think that's what he's trying to do. But I agree with you. These other countries need to step up and do more. All right. It's good to see you as always. Good to Thank see you very much. We appreciate it. Coming up next, a defiant Nikki Haley says she's not going anywhere, even though she faces a 30 point gap against Trump in her own home state. Talk about how the media is doing the math for this one time accountant. And Massachusetts gives migrants three meals a day. $31 for dinner. The unusual group starting to get angry over migrants living large. This is Kelly Meyer. Get my podcast, Kelly in the Capital, at newsnationnow.com or wherever you get your podcasts. 
Crypto Fits, crypto breaking news. Brought to you by ReadingBitcoinCenter.com as we dive into some crypto lingo. Blockchains. A blockchain is a database or ledger of linked records distributed over countless computer systems around the world. The goal of a blockchain is to allow digital information to be recorded and distributed, but not edited. In this way, a blockchain is the foundation for immutable ledgers or records of transactions that cannot be altered, deleted, or destroyed. This is why blockchains are also known as a distributed ledger technology or DLT. Blockchains are best known for their crucial role in cryptocurrency systems for maintaining a secure and decentralized record of transactions. However, the blockchain concept was defined almost two decades before Bitcoin. Its ability to guarantee the fidelity and security of its data and generate trust without the need for a trusted third party makes it the perfect foundation for cryptocurrency. Michael was here today and I wish our children and I could see him tonight but we can't he's serving on the other side of the world where conflict is the norm where terrorists hide among the innocent Sticky Haley rare moment of emotion for her on the campaign trail Latest polling shows her 20 points down in her home state to President Trump ahead of Saturday's primary. I refuse to quit. South Carolina will vote on Saturday. But on Sunday, I'll still be running for president. I'm not going anywhere. All right, News Nation contributor, founding editor of Media, Colby Hall is here, also our On Balance resident philosopher. A lot to unpack here, and I, I had not yet seen the soundbite cut that way, and I reacted sort of as I was listening. Where's that Nikki Haley been for the past eight months? Great question. It was an authentic moment, and it put in stark relief her difference from um, former President Trump. Like, she... she She's never been emotional. She's a strong, powerful, successful woman. Good for her. But she got caught up in this. And the fact that um, Trump sort of made some hay in the fact that her husband is not on the campaign trail, suggesting nefarious things one can only imagine. When in fact, he's serving the country, I believe, in Africa. Um, it's a great question. And one wonders if Nikki had sort of provided that sort of real, authentic moment earlier, there might be a slightly different conversation. Probably not, but maybe it would be a bit closer. Yeah, look, there's always the woulda, shoulda, couldas. I mean, I remember the Mitt Romney speech uh, right after, uh, he, you know, when he gave his concession speech. Where was that Mitt Romney for the for the six months of the general election? Happened with John McCain um, as well, but it, it, it's happening now. This is an important question, though. How and what is the responsibility of the media to cover this race uh, that in some ways it, it oscillates, right? That in, in for some segments that we see on television, uh, it's done, Donald Trump is the nominee, and then the, the same show, the same network can't give up the idea that there's a Republican horse race. Well, I, the responsibility is different from what they're going to do to drive ratings, right? They're, they're, these two things are are not the same. Um, political media ecosphere loves themselves a horse race, and it's simple supply and demand. There's, there's a greater demand in that world uh, than there is supply. They can't talk about Trump and Biden all the time, and so enter Nikki Haley. I think she's wise to stay in because she's the longer she stays in, the more airtime she gets, even if she's tilting the windmills. She doesn't really, I think, have much of a chance unless, of course, Trump gets charged criminally and can't serve or run for office, which seems unlikely, she's going to raise her stature. She's going to sell more books eventually. She's going to be on TV more. And, uh, you know, I think it's that the, the media loves a civil war within a party, especially the GOP. And right. it's a legit thing. There's, you know, half of the Republicans didn't vote for Trump in Iowa and New Hampshire. I don't think you can sniff at that. You listen to some commentators, you read some publications, I'm thinking about the Washington Post especially, that views Donald Trump as 
this existential threat to the country, right? That the, the, the republic in the experiment will end if he is elected. So you would think to that end that they would be all in as much as a newspaper should be within the bounds of ethical journalism that they sometimes stretch for Nikki Haley. And yet there was a story that we saw. Haley's nearly all white high school lacked lessons of racism some say. Uh, The only thing I think you can conclude from that, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that the Washington Post doesn't really hate Donald Trump. They just hate all Republicans, and they'll find anything they can, no matter how absurd it is. Well, I will tell you that the thought leaders uh, on sort of social media and the conservative side of the aisle echoed that same exact point. And it's part of this trope of like traditional mainstream outlets, whether it be the New York Times or LA Times or the Washington Post, finds, you know, a Republican candidate and says, oh, they're negative. They did something bad. Right. It was a different era. And, um, you know, I think racial Wait, politics. But this, is, this, isn't attacking, this isn't attacking. This isn't attacking what Nikki Haley did in high school. This isn't like saying, well, when she was running for student body president, she said X, Y and Z. This is going back and looking at the high, high school curriculum of of a high school with with which, by the way, she was not an, a, a white student at this all white high school and saying some say I just don't get it. Well, it's a sort of it's kind of a smear. And there's this trend now where we uh, judge things in the past by the politics of today when I'm old enough to know that. You know, yes, we learned about slavery, but, but, you know, we didn't get explicit lessons about racism. You know, for better and worse, we sort of ignored it, but it was a different time. And so if we had judged everything that had happened over the 60s, 70s, and 80s by our current sort of woke and, and politically correct standards today, everything fails, right? And I, I would argue that we're not any happier as a result, and that's a real uh, uh, you know, as a result, no, no, we're it's good, each other I want to, get, I want to play this soundbite from 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 Haley's speech. You called it the state of the race speech that you picked up on. Take a listen. Despite being a de facto incumbent, Donald Trump lost 49 percent of the vote in Iowa. In New Hampshire, Trump lost 46 percent of the vote. That's not good. We're talking about almost half of our voters. What does it say about an incumbent who's losing nearly half of his party? It spells disaster in November. Is that part of this? And, and, I, and I'm wondering if we're starting to see sort of an insurance policy by some members of the media that they realize that if Haley is the nominee, as unlikely as that may be, Joe Biden gets shellacked. There is not even a race. And there's a little bit of fear in there. It's like, yeah, we really like a horse race. And yes, we like beating up on Donald Trump. But if Haley's the nominee, we're in trouble. Well, I, I think she's far more electable for a ton of people that represent, you know, the center, the center left to the center right and everyone in between. She's not old. She's not a walking cadaver. And she's not a wannabe dictator to, to the caricatures. I don't think there's a coordinated effort to smear her. I do think is that she raises in stature. People look more carefully at you know her upbringing, and uh, and sometimes it it seems unfair. I think she made a compelling point there. I think, and she, you know, who else loves that point is Joe Biden, presuming he yeah. ends up finally getting the nomination and isn't replaced down the line. So, yeah, it, it's 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 far from over, and I think she's wise to stick around, and the media is happy to keep her around as well. That's yeah, a good point. And she's got the money to stick around. The donors like it, like her as well. Colby Hall, always good to see you, my friend. Thank you very much. Friday, we Thank will you. be in South Carolina talking to the voters and both campaigns on balance 7 p.m. live Friday night from Charleston. Saturday, special coverage of the South Carolina primary starting at 7 p.m. Eastern as the votes come in. Watching local news, and I used to be a local news reporter, was for a long time. Watching local news tells you a lot about a community, what the community cares about. And local news largely chases ratings, but stays away from hot button issues. They have to appeal to everyone. And fair to say, journalists in local newsrooms are probably a little liberally biased, as is most journalists. So when they tackle the migrant crisis, for example, it's all about compassion, not about the problems, not about the hard truths. 
Here is reporting, though, from WBZ in Boston, about as liberal a community as you get. The Commonwealth has not been shy about how much money sheltering migrants is costing taxpayers. The state has 17 contracts for housing, totaling more than $116 million. In some cases, the hotels are collecting money from the state for three meals a day, $16 for breakfast, $17 for lunch, and $31 for dinner. That means $64 a day per person. Paid for by the taxpayers. You can eat pretty well for $64 per day per person of tax-free money. That's not per family. That's per person. So this isn't about the migrant crisis. It's about the people who now care about the migrant crisis, all the people watching local news in Boston. Suddenly people, voters who may not really pay attention to much about politics, they care about their local communities. Now they care about what the migrant crisis is costing them. We went back and watched that entire Boston report. It was a good report. It didn't include a single frame of video of people crossing the border illegally. It was all about local news, what was happening in Boston. A local news director in Boston knew he would get ratings by doing what reporters are supposed to do. They followed the money. Nothing annoys taxpayers like their hard-earned money going to somebody else. There are a lot of taxpayers who would love $64 a day to spend on food. And to be fair, Massachusetts doesn't really have a choice. They guarantee a right to shelter paid for by the taxpayers. Same with New York City and a number of other uber blue progressive cities. Boston spending so much money on food and shelter, Massachusetts spending so much money on food and shelter, well, they finally realize that the money is going to run out sometime, as Margaret Thatcher said. Pretty soon you run out of somebody else's money. That's the problem with socialism. So Massachusetts asked families to take in illegal immigrants. They are hardworking. They want to learn. They want to be successful. And I feel great helping, and I get to understand the refugee crisis from the inside. And God bless anybody willing to open their home. Those are the stories, those sort of happy stories that you expect to see on local news. When they start talking about how much things cost, as they are now, the tide is turning. Speaking of how much things cost in our taxpayer dollars, we're following the money to the Middle East, where we are using multi-million dollar missiles to shoot down $10,000 Iranian drones. How Iran continues to beat us at our own game. So China can sit back and laugh. The past 48 hours have shown the deterrence attacks against the Houthis aren't working. That's the Iranian-backed group in Yemen. U.S. Central Command says U.S. warships have successfully stopped up to 17 attacks by the Houthis in the past two days. And despite U.S. attacks on Houthi positions in Yemen... They're firing off everything they've got, anti-ship ballistic missiles, surface-to-air missiles, dozens of drones. And the first, for the first time, it appears the Houthis have struck a British tanker and might actually sink it. Sabrina Singh is here, Deputy Press Secretary for the DOD. Sabrina, it is nice to see you as always. Uh, what has to happen for the Houthis to stop firing on U.S. ships? Well, thanks so much for having me. Look, I can't predict what the Houthis are going to do. Uh, what we are going to do is we are going to continue to take action. We're going to continue to hold them accountable. Every single time that they launch or, or attempt to launch a surface-to-air missile, we are able to either pr uh, preemptively uh, strike or able to intercept as it launches. Uh, look, some of the attacks do get through. As you mentioned, uh, one of the uh, surface-to-air missiles did hit a UK flag ship. Um, that ship is continuing to take water. But for a majority of the time, these Houthi attacks are unsuccessful and crew have sustained minor injuries and minor damage. What you just described is a tactical situation, right? We're going to keep responding intel. I, I guess the question would be, is there a discussion of changing the strategy in that we go on the offensive against the Houthis rather than remain, as you pointed out, on the defensive? Well, we actually have gone on the offensive. Uh, we've conducted coalition strikes with partners uh, mm. from other nations around the world, uh, striking Houthi targets, and really done considerable damage to some of their launchers, some of the facilities where they store uh, these weapons and these systems that they're using to launch at 
whether it's U.S. vessels or innocent commercial mariners that are transiting the Red Sea. Right. So you have seen us take these proactive steps. You've also seen us take dynamic strikes. That's something that I alluded to earlier. When we see some of these missiles getting ready to launch on rails, uh, we immediately strike. So far, it looks like we've spent about $400 million uh, in the surface-to-air missiles that are launched by the United States um, to intercept the Houthi drones. Some of these Houthi drones are ten to $25,000. Um, it doesn't take an economics degree to understand that that's, that's good math for Iran and the Houthis, bad math for the United States uh, in terms of cost. But we, we extend this out. How worried is the Pentagon about supply of these missiles vis-a-vis having to fight another war, say in China, against China or somewhere else, that the Houthis at the behest of Iran and behest of the Chinese are draining our supply? Absolutely. We are incurring costs. Um, we have to also we have to think about what's happening in the Red Sea. We also have to think about what's happening in Ukraine to make sure that we are continuing to flow aid to the Ukrainians in their fight against Russia. And as you mentioned, we always have our eye on our pacing challenge, which is China in the Indo-Pacific. Um, but we can't do this with one arm tied behind our backs. So we are absolutely mm-hmm. incurring costs, which is why we need Congress to approve a budget. And we need Congress to approve this supplemental package. All right, get you to the issue of Ukraine, and I think they're, they they yeah. do come together in this sense. Long-range Army tactical missile systems now being sent, maximum range 186 uh, miles, 500-pound bombs, uh, which which is an escalation, if you will, or uh, an advancement of what of the weaponry we are giving um, to Ukraine. Is there a common theme here? We're doing just enough to sort of hold the Houthis at bay, but not deliver a knockout blow to them. We're giving the Ukrainians and have been for the past couple of years just enough to hold Putin at bay, bay, but not deliver a knockout blow. Two years ago, everyone thought that Ukraine, that Kyiv would fall. And then you saw the Ukrainians, the Battle of Kyiv, Kharkiv, Kherson. They were able to sustain and hold these cities. And they're continuing to push Russia Uh, in the east and the south. They're continuing to defend their sovereign territory. So they're really two separate fights, two separate terrains. Um, And we have absolutely given and armed the Ukrainian uh, military with what they need to be successful in the battlefield. But they're under no illusion and neither are we. Uh, The Russians laid complex, complicated minefields that have uh, stalled some progress. And what's also stalled progress for the Ukrainians is the fact that we haven't been able to give them another presidential drawdown authority package since December 27th. And that's Mm -hmm. why... It's so important that Congress give us the authorities that we can, that we need so we can continue to not only support our efforts in the central command area of responsibility, but also support Ukraine. All right. Sabrina, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. We invite you to subscribe to War Notes. A lot more about exactly what we were talking about, the aid to Ukraine in tomorrow's edition of War Notes. It gives you a free look at the show, 4 p.m., Every day, warnotes.com to subscribe, and you get in your inbox the most important stories of the day, our thoughts on them. You can reply. Uh, we read all the replies that you send in. Also, we'll see you on social media at Leland Vittert on Instagram and Twitter. Coming up next, comedian John Oliver offered Clarence Thomas, the Supreme Court Justice, $1 million a year to resign for the Supreme Court. It's a funny joke. Everybody laughed, but Is that legal? One million dollars a year, plus a free RV, as you heard, to resign his seat on the Supreme Court and thus open up a Supreme Court vacancy for President Biden. And yes, John Oliver is a comedian, but he took great pains to make clear he was not joking. Tom Dupree is here, former deputy assistant attorney general under George W. Bush. Uh, Tom, good to see you. And look... We Oliver went long through all of the freebies that Clarence Thomas has gotten from big Republican uh, donors, private jet trips, vacations, on and on and on, and said, look, I'll, I'll keep you into the style to which you are accustomed if only you resign. Um, I'm wondering if you sort of take this to the extreme, right? If we took um, a big Republican donor, let's just say the Koch brothers, and Donald Trump gets elected, hypothetically, and they offer Elena Kagan or Sonia Sotomayor $100 million to resign their Supreme Court seat so Trump could appoint a conservative justice, I'm not sure that would sit very well. 
I don't think that would get as many laughs as what John Oliver did. I think you're absolutely right. There's a double standard. I think this case probably falls within what I would call the unwritten liberal comedian's privilege, where you can do things that if someone else did it, it would wind up in a federal prosecution. But because he does it, people laugh and brush it aside. But it is a good question. Look, if he had offered Justice Thomas you know, a million dollars to rule a particular way in a particular case, I strongly suspect he'd be en route to a federal prison camp at this moment. Okay, so really, how does this go? If you're the Justice Department, and you've been there, you've made these decisions, how does this conversation go? Because I I don't think the DOJ wants people offering Supreme Court justices money, either joking or not joking. I completely agree with that. I think the way a Justice Department prosecutor would look at this is the first thing they'd do is figure out if they have a case based on the evidence that a federal statute was violated. And I think you could at least make a facially plausible case that when you offer a federal official to take an action such as resigning his federal commission, that could fall within you know the ambit of the federal bribery statute if you say, I'll pay you to do this action. However, I think a federal prosecutor would also say, is this the sort of case where I could actually get a jury to convict? That's a much tougher question. And I suspect that if John Oliver were prosecuted on this charge, he would probably say that he lacked corrupt intent which is a requirement of proving and getting a conviction under the bribery statute. You basically have to have had an evil motive, a corrupt motive. You knew what you're doing was wrong. And his first line of defense here to Leland would be, hey, I'm a comedian. I was joking. Right. No, I I get that. And I think if he had not said what we're going to play, it would all make sense. Take a listen. We are prepared to offer you $1 million a year for the rest of your life if you simply agree to leave the Supreme Court immediately and never come back. It is that simple. Just sign this contract. Resign and the money is all yours. This is not a joke. If you watch our show, you know jokes aren't really our thing. This is real. So I guess the other thing is he's doing it in plain sight so everyone can see. So uh, there's nothing hidden about this. I guess this goes, though, to this larger issue of the Supreme Court, right? And this is a court uh, divided 6-3 that since 2000, a case you argued, Bush v. Gore, has seen its credibility in the public's eyes plummet uh, and its legitimacy attacked. And I'm wondering how the court, uh, even now and now that people are openly joking about bribing justices to retire, uh, how the court gets it back. Yeah, and I'm very confident the Supreme Court and the justices are well aware that this is kind of a a narrative that's out there and that late night comedians are making jokes at their expense. I suspect they don't really see much humor in this sort of thing. But you're right. The Supreme Court, I think, is attuned to where its standing is with the public. I think the way that it kind of gets back up in the you know public's estimation is just to continue doing what it always does, which is to decide cases on the basis of the law and the basis of the Constitution and do their best to stay out of these political battles and political frays that inevitably, which way they go, is going to make some segment of the American public say, well, these are just political actors in disguise. They're just carrying out the agenda of the president who appointed them. It's not an easy thing. It's not a quick fix. I think it's just a long slog of continuing to do their job, continuing to follow the law scrupulously and neutrally. Yeah, I'm I'm shocked to hear that you don't think Clarence Thomas is rolling over in laughter um, at John Oliver. But hey, you know, stranger things have happened. Tom, it is good to see you as always, my friend. Thank you. We appreciate it. John Oliver needs a defense attorney. Uh, Tom Dupree is your man. He's available. Coming up next, she's even a U.S. citizen, but she got appointed. Sorry, we'll start this over. She's not a U.S. citizen, the woman you are looking at right now. But somehow she got appointed to San Francisco's Election Commission. How a Chinese citizen ended up on a U.S. election commission and what could possibly go wrong. So do not adjust your televisions. That was the newest member of the San Francisco Election Commission speaking in her native tongue. She is not a U.S. citizen yet. She is a Chinese citizen on the Election Commission in San Francisco, a commission which oversees local, state, and federal elections. Uh, And with that, uh, we bring in John Dennis, who's chair of the Republican Party uh, in San Francisco. John, uh, I I thought 
you could help us understand this? Because I went through just to understand that this wasn't sort of a, a ceremonial role or an advisory role. The San Francisco.gov website, the election commissions, we oversee all public elections in San Francisco. So is, are we to understand that San Francisco has appointed uh, a, a national citizen of another country, one of our geopolitical enemies, to oversee elections there? Yeah, and in a shocking turn of events, simple? they didn't... In- yeah, in a shocking turn of events, they didn't invite a Republican to be on the election commission. No, there, were no, there were no other non-citizens who could fill that role. No fair-minded person thinks that this is a, this is a reasonable thing. Okay, so uh, I feel as though a Republican in San Francisco, there's a lot of things you're not invited to, and we always appreciate your sunny disposition, um, despite getting snubbed in so many ways. But what's the, what is the justification behind appointing, and we invited her to come on, uh, I'm told, um, what is the justification behind appointing someone who is not even a U.S. citizen? Well, there's something going on here. So there was an article in the San Francisco Standard last week, a leftist organization, that couldn't, uh, they couldn't ignore it anymore. San Francisco Republican Registration, the last political entity not controlled by the Democrats in San Francisco, has had uh, registration at an eight-year high. And specifically in the San Francisco Standard article, they said that recent uh, Asian uh, voters are registering Republican in droves. And so I think that this is an effort. Ma- the Democrats are making many efforts to, to stave, stave off this uh, growth in the Republican Party in San Francisco. I think this is one effort. Uh, re- Democrats are also trying to run a slate, a well-funded slate, uh, backed by climate change money, to take over the San Francisco Republican Party. Wait, what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a slate running to try and take over the San Francisco Republican Party, despite the fact that the party is at an eight-year high. Registration had been going down for six decades in San Francisco, and now we're at an eight-year high. So uh, I think this is an effort to to stop that, and that's why, you know, I'm actually running on one of those slates. It's called the CBSF slate, cbsf.site. And we are the people who actually have 150 years of experience, and we've been effective, and they're trying to stop that. Huh. And how would Kelly Wong play into that? Well, you know, the, what they're trying to do, we are doing particularly well with the, the Asian community. The Asian community has been under attack. Uh, the people attacking them are not Republicans. They've been, you know, uh, have, there's violence happening with them. And I think what they're trying to do is send someone who can reach out to that community. The uh, article about it in her own interview, she specifically said that her job is to go out uh, to the Asian community because she's multilingual. Fascinating. Well, I, I guess I mean, just in terms of how this could work, San Francisco's demographics population, 803,000, 21.4 percent of the population um, is Chinese, a third of the San Francisco population born outside the United States. So in a weird way, could this backfire and help you out if she signs up a bunch of conservative Asians? I think I think the Democrats are just you know, stepping only opening their mouths uh, to change feet. Uh, they are uh, constantly doing things now that are hurting themselves, and everything they do seems to help the Republican Party. So we'll, let's, we'll sit back and let them do this. But again, I mean, there are plenty of even non-Republican citizens who could have filled this role. Yeah. I have a lot of people in mind who I could suggest uh, they chose to go in a different direction. With a non-citizen, oh, it's, it's a stick they, in the eye of uh, uh, all, all fair-minded people. Yeah, they probably didn't even call you for your suggestion. You, you, you sit by the phone every day, and it doesn't call, except when we do. John, we always are happy that you're with us. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Here's Chris.